हेलो पवन प्रोफेसर पवन यस यस प्रोफेसर ओके 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 Good afternoon, all. Uh, welcome to the webinar series Meet IIT Roorkee Chemistry Festivals. It's my pleasure to introduce Professor Pawan Kumar uh, Basupanda. Uh, Professor Pawan Kumar completed his uh, uh, doctoral studies in 2015 at uh, from JNCSR, Bangalore, under the supervision of Professor M. Ishwar Murthy in the field of porous materials. His specific research interest was to use supramolecular strategies for pore engineering in mesoporous silicates. After completing his PhD in 2015, he moved to University of Bristol, UK to work with Professor Stephen Mann as a Marie Curie postdoctoral fellow. His research in Bristol was focused on designing and fabricating artificial cells, protocells, exhibiting autonomous behavior. In November 2015, he joined our department, Department of Chemistry at Gurki, as an assistant professor. His research interests are focused on designing active colloidal systems. I welcome uh, Professor uh, Pawan Kumar to give a lecture uh, in, of his interest. Uh, thank you very much. Professor, Professor Pawan. Yes. Am I audible? Hello? Yeah, you are audible, please. Ah, ah, thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Paritosh, for the nice introduction. And, uh, Thank you also to the HOD, Professor Thomas, for organizing this webinar and also starting a YouTube channel for the chemistry department at IIT Roorkee, which is all, I think, a very nice move in this uh, current uh, situation. So, yes, so good afternoon, everyone. So, welcome to my talk. Uh, with, uh, so, I will be talking about dynamic and interactive colloidal systems. So, the outline of the talk is the following. Uh, I will firstly talk about my doctoral research, wherein I was focusing on engineering core properties in mesoporous silica. And uh, our focus was to use reversible uh, chemistry to actually enable dynamic core engineering in mesoporous silica. And then I would come to my postdoctoral research, wherein I was trying to build micro compartments, taking inspiration from biology. And this, uh, this basically helped us. Uh, in actually achieving bio-inspired motility, which I will talk about as well. And then finally, I will try to conclude with uh, my current research interests, wherein I don't really have much data to show, but it would be more to contextualize uh, in, in the current literature uh, with some recent examples and what is our philosophy or our methodology which we'll employ to carry out our work. So it would be more philosophy rather than actual data in the last section. So with that, we can, I would actually then start talking about my doctoral work. So my doctoral work, like I was talking about previously, it is focused on mesoporous silica and pore engineering. And we're trying to engineer the pore properties to achieve various functions and also for different applications. And uh, as you would likely know, mesoporous silica is one of the uh, famous porous materials and it is composed of silica. And one thing most people use in an organic chemistry lab is uh, silica, silica gel for separation of compounds. 
So you would know that silica does not really react with anything, does not interact uh, other than adsorption, other than absorption part. So what we necessarily need to do is functionalize this silica wall, uh, which you can see here with functional groups using silane chemistry or some sort of chemistry. And, and hello. Uh, yes. Everyone except uh, Professor Pawan, can you please uh, now mute your microphone? Everyone except Professor Pawan, can you please mute your microphone? Please, please continue. Yeah, thank you. So we would like to actually functionalize this silica with various functional groups to actually engineer the properties such as size, structure, felicity, or surface type. And just to show you a uh, normal image of an uh, SBA 15, which is one type of municipal silica. This is the FASM image of uh, such a sample. And you can see that in the particle, we have these aligned uh, pore channels, which are of the size of 10 nanometer in this particular case. So it is these sort of small pores which we're trying to engineer for various properties or applications, such as biomolecule sequestration, catalytic support, or as catalysts themselves, or as for sensors application, collision sequestration, and also drug uh, In my particular case, like I was trying to tell you earlier, that I was in focus on, or I was trying to pose the question, whether we can use reversible chemistry to decorate this silica surface with functional groups. And that was the question I was trying to answer in different ways uh, during my PhD. So first thing you would need is, because silica does not really interact with any molecule as such in a specific way. We, what we did was we covalently sensitized it by appending some molecules which can interact through reversible interactions with other molecules. So we had these sort of motifs which can anchor these molecules, which can then reversibly sit on the surface. And then we can go back and forth to achieve reversible function. And for this purpose, we used reversible chemistry. So that we can attach and reversibly detach these molecules and then regenerate our silica and then use it for our So that was the intention. And then we used charge transfer interactions, dynamic covalent chemistry, coronate ester chemistry, hydrophobic forces, and a combination of these interactions to achieve this purpose. So, and I would then like to show you a few examples of how we employed this. Uh, technique of reversible functionalization for various uh, pore engineering purposes. So firstly, uh, pore size and felicity. Here we functionalize the municipal silica with biologen molecules, which are dipositive and are a known electron axis. And then we came up with electron donor molecules appended with different chain length of, different chain length of uh, the alkyl chains so that the size of the molecules is different. Is that better? Hello? Okay. So, what? Uh, so, yes. So, basically, we had this misoporous silica which was uh, decorated with these biologen electron acceptor monkeys. And then we tried to add these PC6 and PC12. So, the smaller molecule led to a smaller uh, decrease in pore size. And then, when we added the larger molecule, we could actually constrict the pore a lot more. So that's how we could actually engineer the pore size in these uh, through this reversible function. And then to show the reversibility, we took SBAV, which is this uh, which is this silica without the supramolecular de decorated the functional monkeys, and then added this PC6 to decrease the pore size, and then remove the PC6 to increase the pore size again. And then we could do this reversibly to actually show the reversible nature of our functionalization. And then. We what we posed was that we can decrease the pore size. Can we also control the surface charge? Because the surface charge in these uh, misoporous silica materials can actually help us define the kind of ions which will go through these pores. So, as you know, the biologen is dipositive, and then we have the pyrimidine which we are actually adding, which is tri-negative. And we also use another donor molecule, which is coronate tetracarboxylate, uh, which has possibility of having four, four negative charges as well. So when either of them binds to the biologen, and if the binding is 100%, then you would actually get the surface charge reversal because this is two positive, and then these are three or more negative. 
So that would lead to a complete surface charge reversal. So that's what we did. And then when we exposed this mesoporous uh, viologen film to pyrin for just three hours, we could actually achieve a surface charge neutral so, because we could actually observe both positive and negatively charged ions passing through the holes. But when we soaked in uh, pyranine for 13 hours or when the functionalization was complete, then the surface charge of the pores was completely negative, which actually led to uh, uh, the positive ions were actually only preferentially going and then the negative ions were not really passing through the pores. So we could actually switch the nature of transport from anionic transport to cationic transport in this case. So that's how we could actually control the surface charge to actually control a function, which is pore transport in this case. And then we also try to explore these systems for for other applications such as uh, glucose responsive carburase. But since uh, the glucose responsive carburase, we would actually need it to be responsive to glucose, not to a donor molecule to change the design here. And then the pore wall was decorated with a phenyl boronic acid which when it binds to glucose actually would actually get a negatively charged surface. And that would mean that we could liberalize negatively charged carbo or negatively charged uh, drug molecules from the pore cell. And that we actually observed that we had a quantitative response that like what I mean is when we added less amount of glucose, only less amount of carbo was liberalized from the pore, released from the pore. And then as we increase the concentration of the glucose, we could actually liberalize more and more carbo from the pore. And then we could actually get a quantitative response to the glucose in terms of carbohydrates, which may have potential applications in, in some sort of drug delivery systems. And since we could also control the transport in this pose, we tried to pose the question of whether we can control access to catalytic cells and then fabricate switchable catalysts. So what we did was we posted gold catalysts within these pores and turned off and on the transport of reacting molecules towards these uh, catalytic sites. And in this way, we could actually regulate catalysts. We could actually switch on and switch off catalysis through this pathway. And with that, I would actually switch gears and then go on to my postdoctoral work where it was more focused on uh, constructing microcompartments, taking inspiration from biology. And in particular, it was uh, focused on trying to make micro compartments move in a very determined fashion. So we took inspiration from biology for this as well. Uh, so in essence, what we tried to do is actually use simple buoyancy forces, like you will see here, a bubble is being produced within a micro capsule, which is leading to a simple motion, bottom to the top. That's it. It's simple buoyancy, like you would expect. How can you go from this simple buoyancy to a uh, oscillatory motion, like you see here, so you can see that the capsule is moving up and down in an oscillatory fashion. So how do we get from the simple buoyancy to oscillatory mode? That would be the focus of uh, this postdoctoral section of my talk. So like I said, uh, biology has brought many inspiring uh, examples of motility, wherein we can see that bacteria has this flagella, which is quite a complex structure to mimic. So, but this enables very directional motion by this bacteria in search of nutrients or away from predators or in search of better living. So this is very deterministic motion, but to some extent, uh, scientists have been able to mimic uh, such sort of modality in, in, in a very rudimentary way. One of them is bubble propulsion, wherein a catalyst is hosted within a compartment and then the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide releases oxygen bubbles, which are released from one orifice to propel the compartment in the opposite direction. This led to chaotic trajectories at best most of the times. And but directional motility was achieved in when they used Narendini forces to propel oil in water droplets or water in oil droplets. But our inspiration was not really as complex as this um, flagella, which was difficult to make, obviously. What we took our inspiration from was this Synecosystis cyanobacteria which is a very unique bacteria in the sense that it likes to do photosynthesis and then it has these. This is the team image of uh, this uh, bacteria, a cross section. And then you can see these uh, red demarcated areas, which are the gas vesicles within this uh, synecosystis bacteria, which help this bacteria to float up to the surface of the water body so that it can get access to sunlight and then carry out photosynthesis. And then when it has carried out photosynthesis, 
enough, then it actually down regulates the size of these gas vesicles and then sediment down to the bottom, bottom of the water body. And that's how it goes up and down within a column of water to actually carry out photosynthesis at frequent intervals. So this was our inspiration towards which we wanted to work because we wanted to use simple buoyancy features to move microcompartments. So for this, we came up with the certain design strategies so as to be able to achieve this. So firstly, we would need a gas generating pathway so that we can induce supersaturation of a gas molecule within these microcompartments so that the nucleation of the bubble will happen specifically within this microcompartment. And then you would need to have a gas consuming pathway so that we can actually consume the gas bubble and then downregulate the size of the gas bubble and then achieve the sedimentation property as well. And additionally, you will have to stabilize this gas bubble because the interfaces are not really stable until you can actually stabilize it through polymer absorption. And yes, in terms of specifics of the design, we actually constituted the gas generating pathway using catalase as the enzyme which can break down hydrogen peroxide and use oxygen. And this oxygen would likely nucleate the bubble within this microcompartment. And then the gas consuming pathway we used glucose oxidase, which actually converts glucose and oxygen into gluconic acid. And in this process, consumes the oxygen and then helps us to downregulate the size of the gas bubble. So this was a design strategy, and then these were the capsule systems which helped us achieve this. So, how did we make this? Is in the following way. We took DNA with the various enzymes which are necessary to be encapsulated within the syringe and then extruded it through a needle and then we had a coaxial airflow to shear this solution into small micro droplets and then these droplets were made to fall into a clay solution which is a cationic clay dispersion. In specific here we have this amino clay. So amino clay has this positively charged uh, sheets. So this positively charged sheets could actually interfacially interact with this DNA droplets which are negatively charged to form a membrane and then result in the formation of this hybrid clay DNA microcapsules. So we have the DNA rich interior, which has these enzymes catalase in this case, and then clay sheets decorating the surface. So this is how we made this capsule. And I would then actually illustrate, uh, show you some of the properties of these capsules before showing you the motility properties of just uh, some capsule permeability properties. So this is how the capsules look in a bright field microscopy. Uh, you can see them, they are quite fairly uh, regularly sized. And then because they contain DNA, we actually added actin in orange, which can actually stain double stranded DNA. And that led to the green fluorescence from the interior of these capsules, confirming that all of the interior is composed of, out of DNA uh, entirely, and it has the enzymes as well. So we also tagged the enzymes in another experiment wherein we tagged the catalase with a fluorescein tag and that helped us to visualize the catalase on the protein molecules within this microcompartment. And you can see they are also fairly well homogeneously distributed without any aggregation or anything. And then we went on to study the excuse me, uh, went on to study the permeability of the membrane of these capsules. And we found that the permeability cutoff of this uh, Membrane was in the range of 10 to 20 kilodaltons, that is 10 to 20,000 molecular weight in general. So, all the small molecules can actually permeate through the membrane, but the larger molecules like polymers or uh, various enzyme molecules or protein molecules will actually remain trapped, which will help us to put enzymes inside to act as catalysts and drive their function. So, and then we also try to understand the diffusion properties or the permeability of the membrane. In a kinetic way. So we what we did was we added acridine orange on, a, on the glass leg slightly distant from the microcapsule. And then with time we, we tried to study how the staining of the DNA was happening over time. And we could see that within two minutes the whole of the capsule was stained. And that would mean that the, the exchange of small molecules quite fast and enabling faster reaction. And in order to study how freely the proteins are actually moving about within this microcompartment, we did uh, something called fluorescence recovery after photobleaching studies, which is the FRAP study. So what we do in this case is that we have this selected area, which is indicated by this dotted line, and then we photobleach it using high laser intensity. And that would photobleach all of the fluorescent molecules or proteins within this area. And then the only way the fluorescence in this area will recover is by diffusion of fluorescent molecules from outside this area into this uh, 
material. So what we what we observed is that initially the fluorescence in this area was around 75. We photo bleached it, it went, went down to around 30 and then it recovered slowly within a matter of 30 seconds. So this shows us that these protein molecules are able to freely move within this uh, micro compartment and are not actually aggregated in any way or stuck to any interface. So with that, I would like to now start talking about the buoyancy properties of these microcapsules, wherein we have catalysts within these microcapsules, and the expectation was that when we add hydrogen peroxide, uh, we can actually cause supersaturation of oxygen within this microcapsule specifically, and then it cause nucleation of a microbubble. And this microbubble can actually then grow and then counterbalance the weight of the microcapsule to move it up in using buoyancy. So here I have a video showing you how this was done in our uh, experiment. So we have at the top a PDMS ceiling and we have at the bottom these microcapsules at the bottom. And when I add hydrogen peroxide now, we, you will see st small black uh, spheres forming within these microcapsules causing them to move up. So these black um, uh, spheres forming within these capsules are the air bubbles or the oxygen microbubbles which are formed. And, uh, these are causing these microcapsules to float up to the top. And as you will also notice that in some cases, we have one, two, or more microbubbles forming within these microcapsules. We also studied that, uh, which you will see in the next slide, wherein we studied the nucleation probability with the uh, catalase activity and concentration of hydrogen peroxide. We could see that there are some regimes where there is no nucleation, and in some regimes, there is a single bubble form, and at high concentrations of catalase and histote, we have multiple bubbles nucleating within the process. And you can see here some images showing that uh, it is mostly extracellular nucleation, a single bubble, two bubbles, and then multiple bubbles within the same microcaps. These are some statistics showing the bubble nucleation probability within the population. And uh, then we try to pose the question, can we use this mobility, this directional mobility to uh, move these compartments into a chemically rich environment to trigger a chemical reaction because we know where these capsules are going because buoyancy is directional due to gravity. Gravity is the whole reason why it exists. So we know where these go and then can we place something in their path so that they can actually go into a chemically rich environment and then trigger a chemical reaction. That's what we wanted to do. And then what we did in this case was we took an agarose gel and soaked it in an enzyme substrate, which is this uh, phenopylene bisphosphate which can get uh, broken down by alkaline phosphatase to release phenolphthalein, which is pink in color. So in this particular case, we took these capsules containing catalase and alkaline phosphatase and then added hydrogen peroxide. That led to capsules going up to the agarose gel where the environment is rich in this phenolphthalein bisphosphate, which is then broken down to release the pink color. So I have a I have a video here trying to show you the same thing. Uh, so what we have here on top is the agarose gel. And then I'm trying to add the hydrogen peroxide here. And the capsules are way below at the bottom here. And they will move into the blue as uh, they start to move using these uh, points. So here I'm adding the hydrogen peroxide. And then you will see the microcapsules starting to come up. And then they will get immobilized at this interface, which is rich in this phenolphthalein bisphosphate. And as the phenolphthalein bisphosphate is broken down to phenolphthalein, you start to see this pink color evolve. And then, as you can see, we've actually triggered a chemical reaction using this model. But as you can see, this is quite a simple system. It has just moved to one place, which is chemically rich, which was established by using this agarose gel, and then it triggered a chemical reaction. It's quite simple in its outlook, but what we wanted to then pose the next question is that can this reaction on the top trigger a consumption of the bubble and then cause it to actually go back and forth like the cyanobacteria does. So for this, we wanted to actually do uh, the oxygen consumption pathway as well, wherein, like I was talking to you before, the glucose oxidase can be used within the microcapsule to convert glucose and oxygen and then convert it into hydrogen peroxide and gluconic acid. So in this way, we can actually con consume the oxygen molecules and then decrease the size of the bubble. And in this pathway, we can actually establish a cycle of it going up and then getting consumed and then it comes back down and then the bubble produces or increases in size again and goes back up. This was our motive. And then, uh, so now firstly, we need to study whether 
this part of the the glucose oxidase part of the cascade can actually work do its job. So that's what we try to do in this next slide. So what we did is that we took the microcapsule which has this micro bubble and added glucose, and then we wanted to see whether the oxygen bubble size will decrease with time. So I have a video here showing you that it happens. So what we do here is that we add hydrogen peroxide. Then there's a bubble formed within these micro compartments, um, and that leads to the buoyancy of this microcapsule. And then when we add glucose, the bubble size is slowly decreasing. And then when it cannot support the weight of the microcapsule, it starts to go back down. And because there is glucose in this medium uh, everywhere, so the consumption proceeds to completion and the bubble is completely eliminated. So yes, so the consumption pathway works. Now we need to establish a system where this can happen uh, in a continuous fashion up and down. So for that, uh, okay, before that, some quantitative data on the consumption. So when we added glucose, there was active consumption of the, this is the volume of the bubble plotted here. So the volume of the bubble increases slightly and then decreases at a very fast rate. But when we add sucrose, which is not the substrate for the glucose oxidase, it actually only increases the bubble size. So there is no effect of the glucose oxidase enzyme part. So definitely the glucose being present there is actually doing something uh, in actively causing the consumption of this oxygen bubble. So now what we did was to actually have this uh, continuous spatial oscillations. We actually uh, tried to create this heterogeneous environment, which is basically a glucose enriched environment at the top and uh, the hydrogen peroxide rich environment at the bottom. How we did this is that we had these flows of hydrogen peroxide and glucose at the top and bottom separated by a dialysis membrane here. So this dialysis membrane ensures that only glucose, the substrates diffuse into this central column to establish those local regions of hydrogen peroxide and glucose. And this will enable the whole phenomenon to take place. That's what our hope was. And uh, hopefully this cycle continues and we achieve these spatial oscillations. So what we have here is a video uh, showing that we can actually do that. And in this particular case, we have uh, overall, I think, six microcapsules uh, moving about in this channel. So I will just play the video for you. So you can see that two microcapsules are going down, the, uh, another two coming down, there was another one going up, and then you can see it's like a, a single uh, highway, but two-way traffic. So both of them, they are in their own particular phase of this oscillation, going about their oscillation in a very uh, synchronized fashion. So with that, I have so far showed you that uh, we could actually do reversible pore engineering of musical silica during my doctoral research. And the postdoctoral research, we were focused on uh, trying to actually get these microcapsules to move in an oscillatory pattern, just like the cyanobacteria. And then I would like to now change gears to go into my current research interest, which is active colloid systems. Uh, it is actually here that I would actually like to talk about systems chemistry and uh, it's a new field which is actually coming up and its relevance and what I think we could do in that field at the moment. So I would actually explain these individual terms, systems and the active part uh, in subsequent slides before telling what our focus is. So this is not really a data driven uh, section of my talk, it's more uh, context dependent based on what examples are there in literature and how we can think about it. So yes. Systems are known uh, in a lot of fields. We have weather systems which are very complex and uh, a lot of interacting elements lead to very complex weather patterns, cyclones, et cetera. And then we have very rich phenomena happening due to these interacting elements. And we also have planetary systems. We also have something much closer to us, these biological systems, wherein there's a lot of hierarchy as well, which is very apparent to us, wherein the gene, molecular networks, cellular networks, organ networks, and then there is an individual and then there are social networks as well. So there is a lot of hierarchy in these systems and these are all interacting network elements, interacting wire and network um, based on some sort of hierarchy. So what would be systems chemistry? Itself? So systems chemistry is sort of defined in the following way. Systems chemistry is a science of studying networks of interacting molecules to create new functions with different hierarchical elements and also emergent properties. What I mean by emergent properties is that properties that go beyond the sum of the characteristics of the individual constituents of the system. 
for example, what do I mean by network of interacting molecules? Uh, let's say you have a, a hypothetical reaction like this A plus B going to C, D, E, F, and G in subsequent reactions. One of the key things here is that the D leads to formation of E and F, and this F has an effect, a feedback effect. Uh, that's what this is representing on the transformation of A and B to C. So this is some sort of a feedback effect, something which is being formed downstream is actually affecting the initial reaction itself. So this sort of uh, thing would be the way a network would develop. Interactivity between the particular elements, not going in a single unidirectional pathway, but having some bidirectionality in it. So some systems are known, and a lot of people are doing research on this systems, developing systems in chemistry. And it has been taking off quite well recently. And uh, some of the historical examples of some systems are Bilzer's Zabotinsky reaction, wherein they have some sort of cycles which are enabling a spatial temporal evolution of color. Uh, in this particular case, uh, you can see that in this petri dish, you can see different colors, but it's all a single medium, no interfaces. It's due to these uh, cycles that this rich behavior is actually able to be observed. And seeing these cycles, you might be reminded of these biological systems, the tricarboxylic acid cycle in biology, where the cellular respiration happens. And you can see there are similar but more complex cycles involved. Only thing chemists are at the moment able to do uh, quite simplistic systems. We have to go, work our way up in complexity with, with time. So mostly, uh, I would say that systems chemistry has been dominated by interacting molecules or networks of interacting molecules and you could probably term it small molecule system scales. It is basically molecules which are in a particular uh, medium, they are all interacting, there are no interfaces involved and then they are converting into converting based on various chemical pathways allowed in that uh, reaction setup and then we have these various uh, fields which have uh, come up to show these uh, sort of networks developed. So you can see that Dynamic combinatorial chemistry has some networks which actually guide the evolution of various constituents based on particular conditions. Like if there's a template, you might have a singular formation of one one. And origin of life studies, which actually studies interacting molecules and evolution of uh, autocatalytic networks, and then maybe evolution of life itself. And also the recent Nobel Prize in chemistry, wherein molecular motors were actually awarded the Nobel Prize. You can see that the chemical fuel molecular motion, which actually involves motion of uh, molecular moieties on a circular track here uh, lead, and it's a, also a cycle you can see it keeps moving about and there's interconversion with time and another uh, recent uh, development in super molecular field is that the self-assembly has to be supported by the supply of a particular fuel that is what is termed as dissipated self-assembly self-assembly is not static but if it has to be sustained in this form, it needs to be supplied a fuel. In this particular case, it is a uh, dimethyl sulfoxide, which is continuously being consumed so as to methylate this moiety, which include this uh, red moiety, which can actually self assemble this. So, dissipative self assembly is another uh, small molecule system chemistry example. So, what happens now if we actually add an interface and then create a micro compartment? So, compartmentalization enables. Uh, an additional level, I think, in systems chemistry, and you can probably call it a colloidal systems chemistry. And, and please note, all of this is just an opinion at this point. Uh, the field is evolving, and then I believe the field will actually diversify, and then you will have different sub branches. And this may be how we can evolve. So it's just a hypothesis at this point. So, if you have a compartment, so what it would mean is that the compartment can allow separation of chemistry. In this particular case, what I've represented here is enzymes within a compartment, and then there are substrates diffusing through the compartment, getting transformed into another molecule that is diffusing out. So what it enables is that this chemistry of transformation is being localized to this particular compartment. So what it allows is separation of chemistry. And what it can further enable is that because this is the only part which is doing this reaction. It can enable this reaction to govern its properties. That is, it gives the compartment an agency to control its own fate in some way, if you, have, if you can say. And because these molecules can then diffuse out, this can be a signal to other compartments. And then that can lead to a signaling sort of thing. And this signaling together across multiple uh, colloids can lead to 
a collective behavior or programming of collective behavior. That is the end goal. Uh, that's how even living cells actually coordinate their behavior. They actually signal to each other, and that's how they actually coordinate their behavior. So, for example, I think in terms of agency, I would think that the microcapsule system we talked about before, uh, which I did my postdoc in work, but in hindsight, think about it as a capsule which was able to define its own fate because it could actually encourage different reactions happening in different parts of the reaction medium, and then it could actually move in a particular pathway defined by its constituents in some way. So it is some sort of rudimentary agency given to the microcapsule because of the fact that it can actually force the reaction within itself, which is allowing it to determine its own fate in some way. So then, yes, so you can also have these, like I was saying, uh, you can have a microcompartment communicating with another microcompartment by release of certain molecules. In this particular case, this is from a nature communication paper recently, which released an AMP molecule, which was then absorbed by another cell, and then it triggered another reaction pattern within this receptive cell. So, as you can see in this microscope image here, you have these uh, center cells which are sending the message at, in this part of the microscope image, and then there are these receiver cells in this part of the uh, sample. And then as the signal is propagating, you can see that more and more of this cyan or blue color is being appearing as these dots in this microscope image. It just means that the signal is transferred from this to this to trigger the coloring of cyan of this receptor cell. And then the, you can see in this final image at 130 minutes that signal is actually propagated to the end of the slide or the end of the viewing area. Yeah. So that's how they're able to allow compartments to signal to each other using these small molecules. Uh, and uh, another sort of, so another sort of uh, uh, behavior would be that, okay, the previous example was all colloids which are separated from each other. But there have been some examples uh, wherein they have actually put these colloids together. Here it's actually a water and oil droplet. Uh, so these are water droplets. Uh, functionalized by lipid and then outside is actually oil and then they are connected to each other by pore channels uh, which are laid in the lipid and then due to the osmolarity differences there is uh, inflation of one of the compartments and if these sort of differences happen in a two layer tissue kind of structure the inflation of this compartment can lead to a bending uh, strain on the overall cluster of these droplets so that's how they could actually use uh, small size differences to actually execute a mechanical motion in these uh, droplet clusters, let's say. So they have actually used this even in some way. They created a star-shaped uh, tissue here, which close upon itself to grab objects. As you can see, this is the simulated picture, and then this is the, this is the graphic, and this is the real picture of the droplets actually closing them upon itself to actually enclose something. And this is more mechanical, not really uh, something triggered. This is simply osmosis triggering this sort of uh, mechanical movement, not really some reaction happening within these microdroplets like we were talking about. So here is a recent example of uh, actually chemical reactions conducting through these droplets. These are also, again, water and oil droplets connected by uh, protein channels here. Yeah? And then the signal started up by this red droplet is actually being conducted through this chain of droplets. So I, I guess you might be familiar with the uh, Mexican wave, wherein uh, people in the stadium one by one stand up and then the wave propagates across the stadium. It's a similar kind of thing. Only thing happening at the microscopic level. This starts, uh, starts this cell to glow green, and then that stimulates the next cell to glow green as well, which is basically a reaction happening and then self-inhibiting. That's how the first it blows up and then it starts to go dark and then the signal is conducting through this uh, chain of droplets. So this is some way that the compartments have been linked together and then they are exhibiting a coordinated behavior in some way because they are connected by these protein channels. But one thing to note is that they are oil and water systems, so the signal is not the signal or the molecule which is communicating is not escaping into the water medium. So it is quite a challenge to execute this sort of thing in water and water systems because the signal will actually be dissipated because diffusion can happen. It's not directional anymore unless you can rest it. 
itself. So this is so now I so this is how I think colloidal systems chemistry is going to, is actually being developing so far, wherein they use not interacting set of molecules but interacting set of colloids which can interact between themselves by exchange of molecules. Either they are clustered like this in a chain or like in the previous case where they were actually dispersed in the medium, but they're exchanging molecules to define their properties in some way. So it is a network which is being established between colloids using small molecules as a signal agents. So that's how I think the colloidal systems chemistry is uh, slightly distinct from the small molecule systems chemistry where there is no interfaces anymore. Uh, and uh, the other thing uh, which I was trying to talk about is that how, the, how did I get the active part of my type? So active, what I mean is I've taken it from active matter, which is uh, quite a famous field, uh, dominated by physicists mostly. And then I have two examples here uh, uh, from two different papers, uh, mostly done by physicists here. And you can see that they execute very interesting motions and then they are able to cluster together and then move away from each other. But one thing you have to note is that all of these are just colloidal particles. They're not compartments. They're just solid particles or uh, lithographically uh, made uh, films, which are then cut into different shapes. And then these are actually moving in this particular part. They interacting by a physical force to coordinate their behavior. You can see that they're actually going about in circles, actually exhibiting some sort of coordination across these compartments. So, this is possible, but this is actually done only on solid particles. What if we could actually do this on compartments? Because compartments enable a higher level of complexity because the compartments can actually have further structures within themselves, and then that can enable a higher level of complexity in the behavior to be achieved. So the focus of, would be to actually design, couple this motility of these active matter systems and then correlated motility of these active matter systems and bring it to this compartment system. So that we can have active compartment systems. What this would involve is that we have to design for compartments which can actually use these sort of forces, uh, interfacial forces, or maybe wetting behaviors to actually achieve different sort of motions within uh, a medium. And then that would require that we may have different sort of structuration, hierarchical structuration, whether the structure is dynamic or no. What I mean by dynamic is structures can form within a compartment, then maybe dissolve again. That enables further complexity uh, for the compartment itself. So that when they actually be able to move and then, then self organize we can actually expect uh, more complex behavior or we can actually have more variables to program their behavior. So with this, uh, I would like to conclude uh, my talk uh, by acknowledging my PhD supervisor, Professor Andy Shurmurthy, and the various uh, collaborators and co-workers during my PhD and my postdoc supervisor, Professor Stephen Mann, and other co workers and collaborators. Thank you very much. And these are the way, way funding agencies uh, which have funded the work which I've done, and then current funding agencies as well. And uh, thank you very much for your kind attention. Any Thank you, Professor Bhavan, for your, I think, thought provoking lecture. I think there are several interesting things we have seen, like, you know, the oxygen from bottom to top and several other things. It was really a very interesting uh, talk. Now it is question and answer session. Anyone having any question, please go ahead and ask Professor Pawan. Pawan, are you getting any question from, from uh, the audience? Uh, I have not got anything on the chat box at the moment, no. Yeah, you can post your questions also in the YouTube channel.
Okay, so Professor Pawan, I have a question. I think uh, you know, let let's wait. Is there any question from the audience? But I have a question. Uh, yes. You know this and its utilization. Can you can you give some example where we really can utilize this type of system? Okay, mm, you mean within the microcapsule? How we can actually yes, using exactly. the microcapsule system in some way? Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, I I'm not entirely sure, but if this is one way, what what this does is that uh, what the micro compartment can do is in some way soak up the oxygen, which is uh, which can actually build up as a bubble on an electrode. Let's say so, electrode uh, bubble formation may be uh, at some point a uh, problem because that actually uh, inactivates a particular uh, surface of the electrode. So these could be like oxygen scavengers, uh, microscopic agents, we can scavenge the oxygen and then take it up and then consume it and then get back. So maybe uh, I am not entirely sure, but wherever they can, uh, wherever this like any, any, is, uh, What I was actually asking, any, you know, practical application, you can, you can, uh, you know, think or you can have some sorts of, uh, you know. Uh, okay, there may be, I mean, I think it's quite far from what is currently possible, but you know this sort of a system you can probably target. I think in leech there is this uh, water hyacinth sometimes which uh, grows, right? So you would probably need something which can uh, inhibit their growth. So this could be some sort of uh, delivery system which can float up and then prevent uh, the ecosystem of the lake from being taken over because water hyacinth is a uh, Great problem in a lot of lakes where it starts to go. Maybe in that sense, I do not know. Yeah, uh, it is okay. a basic. Okay, I have a second question. Uh, yes. You know, the hydro uh, oxygen generation, you are actually adding H2O2, right? Yes. So if you will, by any other means, produce uh, H2, you know, oxygen, will it again be trapped into that, uh, you know, enclosure, like, you know, this, this, uh, at the system? Uh, I didn't follow. Uh, can you please repeat? Like, let's say the oxygen is being generated by adding H2O, right? Huh, yes. By any other means, let's say we produce H2O, you know, oxygen. Can it still, you know, trap it or it is, you know, only H2O2 which works? Oh, you mean, can there be other sources of oxygen? Yes, yes, yes. Huh. Yes, yes. Actually, uh, uh, one thing I have to tell you is that we have had to struggle really hard to not involve the normal oxygen levels or the differences of oxygen levels in solutions which we use normally uh, to not to interfere with this reaction. Because what happens is there is a lot of dissolved oxygen depending on the temperature of the uh, different solutions which we are using. And then that can also put up the reaction because like I said, uh, this can actually soak up the oxygen from the solution. So if it is already available, super saturated uh, already because you shake the solution and then increase the super saturation of the water in particular way, then you can actually cause this whole thing happen. You don't really need to have any enzymes. If you have another source of oxygen, the, the interface works very cleanly. It's just, um, it's an equilibrium with the solution. So any source of dissolved oxygen will actually make its way to the bubble if it is super saturated or just to actually have an equilibrium so, so that means other... that means yeah that means we can use the system to scavenge oxygen also from a solution right we can make ah. oxygen free any solution yes that is why i was saying that maybe it can be used as an oxygen scavenger from electrodes to prevent uh, losses of uh, bubble formation on electrodes which can actually make you lose uh, precious electrode surface area or something like that you know that is why i was saying that it can be used as an electro uh, oxygen scavenger or any gas scavenger because it's a, at the end of the day it's an oxygen bubble but any gas can also cross the interface because it's just an air water interface at the end of the day so any gas i would think okay. even thank another you. gas you can make you can actually have okay so thank you very much so i think we don't have any question uh so okay. anyway, thank you very much for attending this session
and i hope you must have enjoyed this lecture and uh, once again thank you very much for joining us and we hope you will join us tomorrow also uh, you know there are two sessions on tomorrow have a good evening uh, bye bye thank you I'm closing this session